Hello, Adams. Um, we're going to continue reading our small steps narrative today. So our two core vocabulary. The first one is jubiantly, and this is an adverb, and this means joyfully. Remember, an adverb describes a verb. So if you do something jubilantly, you're doing it joyfully. And then the second one is her herald, heralded, and that means announced, and it's a noun. Our two literary vocab, simile, is a noun, and this is a literary device that compares things using the words like or as. This is super important. If you see a sentence that is comparing two things, you've got to look for these two words. If it uses like or as, it is a simile. However, if it does not use like or as, and it compares two things, it's going to be a metaphor. Okay, so we are on chapter seven today, and this is called Star Patient Surprises Everyone, part one. After successfully swallowing the milkshake, Peg starts to improve. She has an easier time eating, her pain lessens, and breathing is easier. Eventually, she is transferred to another room, where her roommate is an eight-year-old boy named Tommy, who is also paralyzed with polio and needs the help of an iron lung to breathe. Peg and Tommy enjoy listening to the Lone Ranger radio program together. Peg also begins intense physical therapy in hopes that it will eventually relieve her paralysis. On October 1st, I lay in bed with my eyes closed, rehearsing a new joke. As I imagined Dr. Bevis's laughter, my leg itched. Without thinking, I scratched the itch. Then, as I realized what I had done, my eyes sprang open. Had I really used my hand? After three weeks of paralysis, I was almost afraid to believe it. For fear I had dreamed or imagined the movement, holding my breath, I tried again. The fingers on my left hand moved back and forth. I can move my hand, I yelled. Two nurses rushed into the room. Look, I can move my left hand. I wiggled my fingers jubilantly. Get Dr. Bevis, said one of the nurses. She smiled at me as the other nurses hurried out of the room. Can she really do it? asked Tommy. Can she move her hand? Yes, the nurse said. Her fingers are moving. Hooray, shrieked Tommy. The Lone Ranger rides again. Dr. Bevis came bounding in. What is all this shouting about? Feeling triumphant, I moved my fingers. Try to turn your hand over, he said. I tried. The hand didn't go all the way, but it moved. It definitely moved. It was Christmas and my birthday and the 4th of July all at the same time. I could move my hand. Dr. Bevis turned my hand palm up. Try to bend your arm, he said. My hand lifted an inch or so off the bed before it dropped back down. What about the other hand, he asked. Is there any movement in your right hand? To my complete astonishment, my right hand moved too. Bending at the elbow, my lower arm raised several inches. I waved my fingers at Dr. Bevis. By then, I was so excited I felt as if I could jump from that bed and run laps around the hospital. This is wonderful, Dr. Bevis said. This is terrific. I agreed. When your mother makes her daily phone call, Dr. Bevis said, she is going to be thrilled. In the next few days, I improved rapidly. Soon I could use both hands, then my arms. I was able to sit up, start, starting with two minutes and working up to a half hour. Movement returned to my legs, too. My arms were still extremely weak, but I learned to feed myself again, which did wonders for both my attitude and my appetite. I was no longer totally helpless. With my bed cranked up, I could balance a book on my stomach and turn the pages myself. I had always liked to read, and now books provided hours of entertainment. The hospital had a small library. Day after day, I lost myself in books. I began reading aloud to Tommy. I quit only when my voice got hoarse, but even then he always begged me to read just one more page. I preferred reading silently because it was faster, but I felt sorry for Tommy who was still stuck in the iron lung, unable to hold a book. I was clearly getting better. He was not. Each day I read to him until my voice gave out. Dr. Bevis continued to praise and encourage me. Mrs. Crabb bragged about my progress. The nurses called me their star patient. I realized that no one had thought I would ever regain the use of my arms and legs. 
A week after I first moved my hand, Dr. Bevis said he wanted to see if I could stand by myself. First, he helped me sit on the edge of the bed. Then, with a nurse on each side, I was eased off the bed until my feet touched the floor. Each nurse had a hand firmly under one of my armpits, holding me up. Lock your knees, Dr. Bevis instructed. Stand straight up. I tried to do as he said. We're going to let go, he said, but we won't let you fall. When the nurses drop their arms, see if you can stand by yourself. Tommy, my iron lung cheerleader, hollered, Do it, Kimosabi, do it! It was wonderful to feel myself in an upright position again. I was sure it w I, I was sure I would be able to stand alone. I even imagined taking a step or two. All right, Dr. Beva said to the nurses, let go. As soon as they released me, I toppled. Without support, my legs were like cooked spaghetti. The nurses and Dr. Bevis all grabbed me to keep me from crashing to the floor. Disappointment filled me, and I could tell the others were disappointed too. The strength had returned so quickly to my arms and hands that everyone expected my legs to be better also. I'm sorry, I said. I tried. It will happen, Dr. Bevis said. They helped me back into bed, and I was grateful to lie down again. Standing for that short time, even with help, had exhausted me and made my back ache. The twice-daily hot packs and stretching continued, and so did my progress. Each small achievement, such as being able to wiggle the toes on one foot, was I don't know, heralded with joy. I had to keep my feet flat against a board at the foot of my bed to prevent them from drooping forward permanently, and I longed to lie in bed without that board. Okay, number one asks, which quote from the chapter helps the reader understand what an exciting experience this was for the narrator? So which one shows that she's excited? Number two, what is the main event of this chapter? Number three, which quote from the passage does not help you imagine your answer to question number two? So this is related to this question. You're looking for the quote that does not support it. And that's it for today. I hope you guys have a great day and I'll see you next time.